Okay. Well, uh, thank you, uh, gentlemen, and uh, um, Mr. Rambo for coming to this uh, St. Paul speaker series. This is our end of July. No, I'm sorry. Uh, end of August, um, 2022, uh, speaker series. And today we're going to be uh, looking at aquaculture production and trade in Zambia. And our esteemed speaker is uh, Ms. Zangani Chirambo, who is the acting chief aquaculture officer in the Ministry of uh, Fisheries. And uh, accompanying her is uh, Mr. Chad Kanchea, who's uh, the aquaculture research officer and is based in Kitwe, and is also joining us uh, by Zoom. Um, so Mr. Chirambo, the participants in this uh, meeting uh, alumni of uh, St. Paul's Secondary School, which is in Kavwe. And uh, they have an interest in uh, learning about, uh, you know, just the fish uh, industry and uh, <clears throat> how it works and uh, how they can make a livelihood. Um, most of them have uh, some sort of production capacity. So that's where the interest is coming from. So that was team, uh, much of our time. Uh, we'll let you uh, have the floor and uh, uh, please you can take over. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, can you hear me? Yes, please. Okay. So my uh, presentation basically um, is on aquaculture production and trade in Zambia. Uh, it's as we go through the slides, uh, it might uh, sound uh, a bit general. Uh, because we're trying to establish some kind of background. Uh, but uh, maybe later on, uh, as uh, people have particular questions and uh, issues, we can always tackle those on a one-to-one -one basis. Okay. So uh, the presentation, this is uh, basically the outline, the introduction some terms that we use in aquaculture, some um, legal and uh, policy policies that uh, relate to aquaculture, development in general, aquaculture uh, production and trade in, 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 in Zambia, history of aquaculture, uh, the type of uh, facilities that we are currently using or farmers are using, and uh, some of the species that are being cultured, um, the, just the general fish trade in Zambia, uh, some challenges and opportunities and uh, way forward. So on the way forward, uh, you realize as we get down, this, the way forward is just open for what's your way forward and uh, maybe what's our way forward as a department. <laughs> okay, so here we have, um, a map of uh, Africa uh, showing where Zambia is. And we do have a map of uh, Zambia. Um, and then the highlighting basically the, the water bodies that uh, Zambia has. Um, I don't know whether you're able to see Lake uh, Tanganyika there, uh, Mweru, Bangawulu, Lake Kariba, you know, the rivers. The blue lines there basically denoting where we have our major um, uh, water bodies, okay? Um, so Zambia, we all know, uh, we're surrounded by eight countries. We have uh, an area of over 750,000 square kilometers and a population, I think, of roughly 17, 18 million now. We are in the middle of the census, so possibly this number has increased. But what is interesting about Zambia is that we have about uh, 12 million hectares of water, okay? In form of rivers, lakes, and swamps, and about 8 million hectares of wetlands. Uh, in short, we have about 40% of the water uh, in the Sadiq region is in Zambia. So we do have a massive resource that you know, presents uh, an opportunity for uh, fisheries and aquaculture development. 
Uh, we have two major uh, river basins, the Zambezi River Basin in the south and the Congo River Basin. Uh, some of the water bodies that form the Congo River Basin is like Mweru, Mweru Wantipa, uh, Bangwaulu, um, Chambeshi River, you know, that is the Congo Basin. Um, the Zambezi Basin, where we find the Zambezi River, it drains about uh, three quarters of the country's total area. Okay, so basically, wherever you go uh, in, in, in this country, in the west, in the northwest, in the south, you meet the Zambezi River. Um, in terms of uh, uh, terms or aquaculture terms, we define aquaculture um, as uh, the farming of, of aquatic uh, organisms, and these include fish, mollusks, uh, crustaceans, and aquatic plants. In other countries that have marine waters, I think uh, if you've watched Discovery Channel or nature uh, documentaries, you have seen uh, some plants called seaweeds that are uh, being um, that are being uh, uh, grown, and some of these are used uh, in the confectionery uh, industry uh, for for various uh, even in the pharmaceuticals. So all that uh, that encompasses aquaculture, uh, fish farming, which is particular to Zambia, is the uh, rearing or farming of fish in ponds, cages, pens, raceways, and tanks. And this is basically for food and for income. Um, we also have uh, what we call exotic fish and indigenous fish. So exotic fish, this is fish that comes from a different region. For instance, uh, those that are already doing fish farming, I'm sure you've come across uh, a species called, or a fish called uh, Orochromis niloticus, or the Nile fish. Uh, it comes basically from the Nile River. So in Zambia, we refer that as an exotic fish. We also have some um, species, species that uh, have been introduced. in Zambia over time, uh, CARP, C-A-R-P. Um, so these are some of the things that uh, we have. An indigenous fish is one that is native or it's a local uh, fish. Examples of the, those, um, our brims that we are culturing, which you will see in the next slide, those are uh, indigenous uh, species. Okay, so what we have here is um, the um, Niloticus, and uh, the other one is called the Cup. Uh, I don't know whether you're able to see. And then we have our local species down here. Okay. Um, in aquaculture, it's, uh, it, it, it's very important for us uh, to do uh, identification of the fish that we're working with, uh, whether they are male or they are female, uh, depending on uh, what the use is. If you're going to uh, maybe keep brood stock, you need to know um, uh, whether the fish that you have is male or female, and whether the and at what stage they are. So we 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 have a technique that is called sexing, and this is basically where you identify the sex of the fish using the uh, genitals. Okay, so you can see in the pictures. Uh, uh, with the illustration, one is uh, male geni uh, genitals, the other one is for the females. 
Uh, we also have other terms like fry. Okay, so what is a fry? I'm sure those farmers that are already in production, you've come across a fry. If you go to the hatchery, that's, you'll be told, you know, we have fry or we have fingerlings. So a fry is uh, just the developmental stage of a fish immediately after the level a level stage. And this is at an age less than a week. Uh, while the fingerling can be uh, at a stage, developmental stage, uh, following the fry stage at age of 30 to 120 days. Um, um, fish pond. So a fish pond basically is an enclosure, uh, which is constructed with the objective of creating the best environmental conditions for the growth of fish. And uh, also for growing of fish, we also have what we call raceways. Um, this, this is a unit that you can use to grow fish, but this is where water flows continuously. Okay, so the water will flow continuously, will make a single pass uh, through the unit before it's discharged. And sometimes some of these raceways are fed directly from the river and um, or through um, a reservoir, and then the water goes uh, back uh, to the river through uh, what is called a sedimentation tank or a sedimentation uh, pond. Um, yeah, I think we have uh, come across cages or we have heard about cage culture uh, because now it's uh, like the buzzword for uh, fish farming in Zambia. Uh, we've heard of Yalelo, I'm sure, uh, which is doing cage culture on uh, Lake Kariba. So yes, we also have cages. Um, these are fixed or floating enclosures used for rain, uh, rearing fish. And um, we also have what are called hoppers. Uh, so a hopper is like a, a box with uh, different sizes. They are made out of uh, nets or netting uh, material. And they are fixed. You fix them either into the pond, uh, using um, poles. Uh, the goodness with a harper is uh, sometimes when a farmer has limited space, maybe they only have one pond, they can actually increase their production uh, capacity or the current capacity by uh, mounting harpers in their pond. But of course, uh, there are certain considerations that have to be made so that you don't uh, have uh, problems of um, uh, you know, poor water quality re reduction in oxygen and things like that. Okay, so cage culture is basically farming of fish in cages, pen culture uh, equally is farming of fish in pens. Um, then we also, I'm sure we've also come across uh, what is called the sex reverse fingerling because that is what uh, we are promoting uh, for most of uh, the farmers. So this is just an artificially manipulated um, female fingerling that has been uh, you know, administered with uh, a hormone for a period not exceeding 30 days to produce uh, all male fingerlings. So we, we administer the hormone at the uh, time before the fish um, sort of before the sex differentiation happens so that even those females are transformed into, into uh, males. The hatchery uh, is a place where we do artificial breeding, hatching and rearing of fish in uh, the early stages of life. Okay, um, integration. Um, integration is, um, this is a system that where a farmer will incorporate livestock and crops with fish. And uh, in the past, this was very common. It's still common with uh, rural smallholders or rural uh, small scale farmers where they will incorporate um, Sorry for that. Fish farming with um, uh, livestock, 
or uh, yeah, fish farming with um, uh, with uh, rice uh, is common. This is common. Sorry, it's common in uh, Asia where they will grow rice uh, with fish in the in the same um, environment. Uh, in Zambia, Zambia sugar uh, in the I think seventies uh, started this uh, system of integration where they were growing uh, catfish as well as tilapia in, uh, in, 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 in their sugar fields in the same uh, environment where they had, uh, uh, like in the irrigation canals that were feeding their sugar cane, that is where they were growing the, the fish. So this is a system that helps uh, a farmer, a resource poor farmer to sort of like maximize on, um, uh, on, on energy. Uh, so it's a system where what would be considered a byproduct or a waste in one system can actually be integrated or can be used in another system and uh, uh, produce value. Okay, so we have what we call planktons and these are broken down into zooplankton and phytoplankton. These are just minute or small, very small, small organisms that um, you can find in the water and they're very important for, uh, for fish. You can't see them with your naked eye, but uh, in the pond generally you see um, a green bloom uh, after you have added some um, manure, organic manure or inorganic uh, fertilizer. So that green uh, water contains planktons that are made of uh, zooplankton and phytoplankton. You can see the, the, the small organisms uh, under a microscope. Okay. Coming to the legal framework, this list is not exhaustive, but I just wanted to share with you the fact that um, uh, aquaculture development or just fisheries uh, development is uh, the aspiration for, for developing the sector, uh, you know, uh, contained in the vision 2030. And we also have, um, because we have just moved from the seventh national development plan, coming to, uh, to the eighth national development plan, we have these uh, aspirations also uh, being carried forward in the eighth national development plan and uh, looking at how aquaculture fisheries can be developed and what we need in order for us to increase production and productivity, reduce poverty, um, improve incomes or the economy and things like that. Then we also have um, the uh, policy our policy for fisheries and aquaculture is still under um, development. Uh, we have reached, reached some advanced stage, but it's uh, still under development. Once it's uh, promulgated, uh, you'll be made aware of that. But right now we still make reference to the second national agriculture policy, which encompasses the whole agriculture sector. Uh, that's crops, livestock, and uh, and fisheries. Then we also have the National Aquaculture Strategy. This is an old strategy that was developed um, in 2006. We still make reference to it because uh, it's been like the bedrock of aquaculture development in Zambia. And uh, periodically we develop what, what we call uh, National Aquaculture Development Plans. We have just coming out of the last uh, plan, which was from 2015 to 2020. And we are in the process of developing uh, another plan uh, to spearhead uh, uh, aquaculture development based on the gains that we have made from the last plan. Uh, the principal act for fisheries or for aquaculture development is the Fisheries Act. 22 of 2011, uh, but this is uh, also uh, read together with Environmental Act uh, number 12 of 2011, because uh, aquaculture, 
happens in the environment and some environmental or some some um, some areas where you would want to do uh, aquaculture might be called uh, ecologically sensitive areas or uh, for instance uh, i'll give an example of bangolu bangolu is a ramsar site and uh, because it's a ramsar site there are certain considerations that have to be met uh, one of the things that you might not be allowed to to bring into an ecologically sensitive uh, environment are uh, maybe species that are not endemic to that place. So all these um, pieces of legislation have to be considered. We also have the Water or the WAMA Act, uh, which deals with water. Uh, for you to abstract water from the river, you have to have a water right. Um, so there are all these, uh, uh, yeah, all these pieces of legislation that are important in one form or the other. We also have uh, the Zema regulations. At one point, depending on the, um, your production capacity or output, you might be required to do what is called an environmental brief, or you might have to do a full EIA uh, so that uh, you um, sort of like uh, avert fears of uh, environmental damage. Then we also make reference to the um, Animal Health Act because food, fish is food. And so it must meet uh, uh, basic uh, health uh, safety uh, conditions. Am I making sense so far? Are you following? Very much. Oh, very much very so. Much. I've been writing down a lot of questions. OK. <laughs> Okay, so at, um, what's the story about aquaculture in Zambia? So, yeah, in some literature, you read that uh, aquaculture dates back to the 40s, to the 50s. Um, and uh, so fish was raised in dams, in earthen ponds, and uh, also the development of some government fish farms. Uh, so this is basically uh, where we have um, aquaculture starting from. So two of the stations that were established, I think, in the 50s, uh, Chilanga Fish Farm in Lusaka and Mwekera Fish Farm in Kitwe. Okay. And um, along the way, we had um, development of some uh, stations by the missionaries. An example is the fish farm that was done in, in um, Mpongwe, uh, between Mpongwe and Masaiti uh, at Iwenga by the, uh, the priest there, which was later handed over to government, I think in the 1970s. So at present, I think plus or minus, we do have about 21 fish, fish farms. Um, well, some of them are called research stations, but in general terms, uh, we have about 21 fish farms. And then um, in, the, in the years after, uh, we had a number of projects, a number of uh, uh, donors that came in and assisted government uh, you know, to promote aquaculture. Like uh, if you go to Northwestern province, there were uh, projects by Africa, there was a project by uh, a wild fish. At that time, they were called Iklam. Now they're called wild fish. There was a, a project there that um, promoted aquaculture. And a lot of farmers were encouraged to uh, construct ponds. There are a number, a good, a great number of ponds in, in, in districts like Muinilunga and Kasempa because of uh, those projects. So here the focus basically was um, food security. So the farmers were uh, encouraged to keep fish as a food security measure. And um, over time, the government uh, used uh, these uh, fish farms uh, as uh, platforms for providing extension services as well as uh, as demonstration uh, sites and also places where farmers could get fingerlings 
and could be taught on how to keep uh, fish and also how to make uh, uh, home um, homemade feeds. Okay. Um, I'm using some old statistics, but I think we have more than 14,000 uh, small scale farmers and we have um, uh, maybe more than 20,000 uh, fish points throughout the country. We also have um, more than 15 uh, active large commercial farmers. We have uh, land-based and we have uh, uh, water-based uh, fish farms, commercial fish farms. Um, on the copper belt, I think we have um we still have about uh, two or three and some more are coming on and then uh, we have in in lusaka around lusaka we have chirundu brim a few uh, fisheries uh we have palavana uh we have uh, yeah we have a number of uh, of, uh, of of farms that have come up including those that are just uh, into production of fingerlings or what you would call the hatcheries. So there has been in, I think the last five years or so, um, there's been some very increased investment in the sector. And we have seen an expansion uh, in aquaculture across uh, all 10 provinces. Um, we are, still i think uh, among the uh, largest producers in in africa uh, we, we we could be about number four now or maybe we're still at number five i have not checked but i think we are yeah last time i checked we were like the fifth largest producer in sub-saharan africa egypt is uh, leading and uh, yeah the production is massive um, I'm sure if you've seen any documentaries about aquaculture in Egypt, it's, it's amazing that a country that has just the Nile River can do so much and we have 40% of the water in Sadiq region. That is meant to provoke you. Okay, so in the past, Fish farming has basically ranged uh, from extensive to intensive and from multi-species to uh, mono species culture. So this is where like multi-species, the farmer might have several species, maybe several tilapia and the catfish in there. But uh, uh, the current practice for most of the farmers has been to keep uh, one species so hence the monospecies culture. Um, and uh, yes, we have, uh, uh, we, we, we have uh, like the farming systems, I said, they range from extensive. So you have some farmers that uh, do very minimal management. Uh, they will supplement with feed or they'll put manure and not really do uh, some very serious feeding. But there are some farmers that are very intensive when you look at cage culture by Yalelo, that's a very intensive uh, form of production. We have uh, different levels of farmers. Uh, we also have subsistence farmers, very small farmers, very small uh, production. And uh, sometimes uh, they don't even harvest completely. They might just harvest partially for the port or for for sale just to meet small, you know, immediate needs. But we have subsistence, we have small scale. Uh, yeah, we have a small holder, but within the small holder, we have those that we might call uh, emergent and uh, a, a small holder commercial, as well as the large commercial. Um, so for our small scale farmers, uh, some of them, they produce between uh, one to two tons, but there are some that produce less than that. Mm. 
Okay, so a smallholder farmers um, combine their fish farming, like I said, with livestock and crops, and their production varies, but um, they will do that for uh, generating uh, income. Some might also do that for food uh, security, but mostly uh, it's for generating income. Um, our commercial fish farming is um, focuses on high production. It's in, intensive. It also is uh, has high levels of investment. It's uh, basically market oriented. And uh, sometimes it will focus on uh, specialized uh, markets. Most uh, commercial uh, farms will produce on average six tons per hectare per year or more. Others will produce more. Um, the average production in, uh, in, in, in cages of uh, that measure 216 uh, meter cubed is about 3.5 tons, but depending on, on the production or the level of uh, management, some uh, can attain higher volumes than that. Okay, so these are the species that are being produced. Uh, Nilotikas is very common in the southern part of Zambia. Uh, most uh, cage uh, farmers on uh, Lake Kariba, starting from Siavonga all the way to Sinazongwe there, uh, keeping Niloticus. Uh, then in places like uh, Copper Belt, uh, Central Province, Northwestern uh, Province, they're keeping uh, Andersonai. The uh, Renderly is um, it's, uh, it's a common uh, species, I think, almost countrywide. Uh, in the northern part, we have some farmers that are keeping uh, Oreochromis makocha, uh, and uh, others are keeping uh, Oreochromis tanganyike, like those that are doing cage culture on uh, uh, Lake Tanganyika, they're keeping uh, Oreochromis tanganyike. We also have some farmers that are interested in keeping catfish, uh, although those are I think, slightly fewer in number. Um, and also we have some common carp, but since it's an exotic fish, it's mostly confined to uh, farmers that have a license to keep it and also our research stations. Okay, so like I said, uh, Niloticus very common with cage culture. Uh, the other uh, three species are common uh, with, uh, and, uh, with ponds, but we also have uh, some uh, outfits that are trying to put up um, uh, cage culture on Lake Itezi Tezi in uh, central province, and um, they are trying to use uh, Andersonai. So we'll see what uh, the future holds. Okay, so examples of uh, aquaculture facilities that uh, we have, we have ponds. Uh, these are called FN ponds, the ones uh, that are on my uh, top left. The other one with a black liner is um, it's an FN pond, but which has a pond liner. Uh, usually where we have pond liners, it's a situation where the, the pond cannot hold water. It has high levels of seepage. So to prevent that, the uh, pond will be lined. Uh, it's quite costly, but um, yeah, if the benefits outweigh the cost, why not? In the uh, bottom uh, left here, we have uh, a picture of uh, a hatchery. We have some hatching uh, uh, jars and some uh, trays where the, once the fry, you know, hatch from the eggs or the larval hatch, They'll fry, uh, they'll swim out and come into the trays. Okay. And the bottom here on the bottom right, I think we have uh, a cage. Uh, Mr. Ambo, so, 
Yes. Uh, somebody wanted to ask you a question. Yes, I, please ask. I think we should have provided this opportunity because I have written so, so many questions. Mm -hmm. I should have provided uh, an opportunity opportunity for people to ask as you are going because this information is uh, is wonderful and uh, if you're not taking notes you might lose something i think um but before the question comes in i wanted to tell you that uh, your brother msenga has joined the, the call okay uh, so yeah so you are notice now you can't uh uh what, what's the word you have to make him happy <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, I will call him and uh, he can always uh, get this information at a fee. But, <laughs> you know, he's a lawyer, so he's going to... Yes, because if I go to his office, he's going to charge me for, the, for, the, for retaining him. Right, right, right. <laughs> yes. Cool. Um, okay. So somebody had a so, question about commercialization. Please go ahead and ask Ms. Chirambo the question. Please ask so that I can deal with it as we go. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much uh, for sharing uh, information. I was just wondering, um, on some of the species that you shared with us that people uh, are growing for commercial production, why mm -hmm. don't we have some of our, our local breeds? Uh, I don't know the scientific names, but uh, you know things like Buka Buka, uh, Imboa for those in uh, Luapula, um, mm -hmm. those types of breeds. Is there anything that prevents those breeds being uh, uh, going into commercial production because I think they would suit the market because people already have them uh, and are, are used to eating them. Okay. Yeah, the Imboa is a very popular question. Um, and uh, so, so as a department, we are uh, we understanding its biology it's uh, so it's reproduction as well as it's feeding so we have uh, we have a one of our officers who's doing uh, some studies and she's studying the uh, boa to understand its biology as far as reproduction and uh, feeding is concerned so if we understand how it reproduces then we can uh, develop uh, breeding uh, protocols in captivity so that we understand exactly what, uh, if we're going to do artificial breeding, how are we going to do artificial breeding? If we're going to breed it naturally, then what are the uh, uh, conditions, environmental conditions that will allow it to breed? The tilapias are very prolific. They are very, um, they're easy to breed even in captivity. And that's the reason why you see them as being very uh, common for culture, okay? Uh, the other species, uh, they don't breed so many. Uh, they don't give you so many offspring or they will need um, in, the, in the wild or in, the, in their natural habitat, they don't, do not breed in the same place where they grow. They have to go to a certain environment that um, uh, is suitable for breeding. So they do some sort of like periodical uh, migration, okay? So they'll migrate to their breeding grounds and after they have bred, then they'll come back to the place where they will grow. So we need to understand those dynamics, those patterns in order for us to develop a breeding program for boa. But it's already on the cards and uh, we have an officer who's doing her master's in, in, in that uh, particular case. Uh, the Buka Buka, uh, I, well, I, I, I don't probably have a straight answer, but I think it's also the difficulties of breeding certain species. It's uh, some of them are easily bred in, I mean, they easily breed in the, in the wild, because they, they depend on uh, certain information that is provided by the environment or certain cues that tell the fish it's now time to breed. Uh, I'll give you an example, like catfish. In Bemba, it's called the mulonge. Mulonge, milonge, um, what is it called, the nyanja again? Uh, well, but at least we, we get a sense. So for catfish, um, or mulamba, yes, it's called mulamba. So in milonge, mulonge, 
they have certain cues in the environment. And one of the cues is the flash floods, okay? So when the rain starts and it has those, uh, uh, there's that flash flooding, that tells the fish to now migrate to their breeding areas. So in order for you to breed them uh, naturally, you have to mimic those conditions. So uh, fortunately for um, Mulonge, we have an artificial program for breeding. And Mr. Kanchea, who is sitting in with us, is, uh, that is some of the work that he does. Uh, his uh, specialization is uh, fingerling production and hatchery management. So for, for anyone that wants to go into a hatchery, uh, est establishing a hatchery or fingerling production, um, you can get in touch with Mr. Kanchea. I hope I have uh, answered your question. Oh, yes, you have. Thank you very much for, for that information. I really appreciate it. Thank you. So we will keep you posted on uh, what advances we, 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 we have. Um, at the moment, uh, in order to also improve the performance of our species, although this is something that I have not included in this presentation, we, are also, we also have uh, what we're calling the Genetic Improvement Program which sits at uh, Najik in Kitwe, where Mr. Kanchea is coming from. Uh, maybe at a later stage, if we still come back to this forum, we can come and talk about that. But we are working on one of our local species, which is the Andasonai or Yokomis Andasonai. And we're trying to uh, uh, sort of like isolate certain, um, certain traits that can improve its growth, its performance, so that uh, we, we can uh, in, improve uh, overall production and productivity. Okay, so just to give you a sense of what production has been from uh, uh, maybe 2011. So those are the figures in, for aquaculture. And somewhere before 2011, I think our production was uh, was varying between 5,000 and 8,000 tons. But if you can see from that uh, table, we have uh, been steadily improving. So our current production as of 2021 was 63,000 um, metric tons from aquaculture. And about 80% of production, 80, 90% is basically tilapia. Okay, so in terms of production from both capture fisheries and aquaculture, that has been the, the production trend. So aquaculture is in green. You can see that it's, 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 it's uh, increasing, steadily increasing. During some years, we were almost not growing, but now we have, uh, you can see that there's been a steady uh, growth. Uh, uh, the blue line is um, fish from the wild, from capture fisheries. You can see that there are all those uh, points where the production would peak and the production would go down. Uh, basically, this just shows you that um, there's only so much that we can get from capture fisheries. Okay, so in terms of um, consumption, our consumption is about 6 kg per person per year, uh, declining from something like 12 kg per, uh, per person per year. Uh, FAO recommendations are that uh, each person should consume about 24 kg per person per year. Okay, so the, de the decline in the consumption per person is attributed to low production uh, which cannot match the increase in the uh, population. So the, the more we are increasing in terms of population, the less uh, fish that is coming from capture, so the less the consumption the person. Uh, this is just an average, but if you were to go case by case, you will realize that in some instances, in some places, people consume even less than one, uh, one kg per year, per person per year. Okay, so that uh, should uh, 
that should motivate the, uh, the, the should motivate you as a potential investors, as a players in the value chain, in the fish value chain to do more so that we can improve our consumption per person uh, per year. So our projected production to meet that 12% uh, per capita per person uh, consumption, we need about uh, over 216, thousand metric tons. This is at 12%, but if we say we go to 19%, the figure will be more. And so it will show you that uh, we have a deficit. Our current production as of 2021 was 158,000 metric tons against a projected production of 12, uh, of 20, uh, of 216. That gives us a deficit of roundabout 58, 60 metric tons, 60,000 metric tons. So in order for us to get to this level, we have to increase production, but in the short term, the country continues to import uh, fish from China, from Namibia, from South Africa, and from Europe, basically. And most of the fish that is uh, imported from, from China, we're importing tilapia, from uh, and uh, for the common market, that is, from the Sadic region like Namibia, we are importing horse mackerel, and uh, yeah, basically those are some of the common species that hit the market. So this is what uh, the um, the fish trade uh, at Kasumbalesa looks like. So what you are seeing there are boxes of uh, horse mackerel being uh, re-exported uh, into Congo. So this is fish that is imported into Zambia, but when it gets to Kasumbalesa, it uh, gets re-exported. And in most cases, it's informally, because if you go to some the Zambia Statistical Agency, you discover that our export figures are very low compared to what you get uh, through the cross-border association at uh, Kasumbalesa. So these are bikes that are carrying boxes of fish. And some of these boxes are 20, 30 kg per box. And these people can carry even 40 boxes on these bicycles. Okay, so I've, I've talked about what we're importing. Um, yeah, the markets, Lusaka, Copper Belt, uh, open markets are Kasumbalesa, Chisokone. We also have fish being sold in chain stores and uh, fish shops in the townships. Okay, so what are the opportunities? So we have an annual demand of more than 200,000 metric tons against the domestic supply of 158,000 metric tons. And we also have a potential export market in the form of the DRC, the Democratic uh, Republic of Congo. And uh, so what is, uh, what, what is uh, sort of like uh, making this uh, demand higher uh, within the local uh, population is uh, the increasing preference for, for fish uh, against red meat uh, and also the job opportunities that uh, the fisheries or the fish value chain uh, presents, as well as the human uh, population increase. Uh, right now, aquaculture has um, political goodwill from the government. There's the government policies and political will is very high. So we do have the uh, enabling environment to take advantage of the opportunities that uh, aquaculture presents. So some of the opportunities are one in the input supply, okay? We do have a number of hatcheries 
uh, but some of those are not really performing as uh, expected. Uh, some of the challenges that I think we will see that are arising or have, are there already is the source of broodstock. There are some hatcheries that are still importing broodstock from Thailand, especially the ones that are doing niloticus. They import broodstock from Thailand. So what that essentially means that we have a, an industry that is still um dependent on imports so we lose a lot of our forex because we always have to take get a brute stock out of uh, from another country source it from another country um then we have um we have opportunities in an um, establishment of uh, um what we call nurseries so a nursery just like the word nursery uh, for a, a baby is a place where you grow fish. You don't actually do the breeding. So you cut out the, the, the headache of having a, a you know, breeding tanks or breeding uh, stock, maintaining that stock, feeding it and everything. So all you do is you get the fry, feed it to a certain level, they reach fingerling size and you offload onto the market. So we do not, right now, I think there's one person that started with the nursery, but uh, it hasn't taken off as expected. So we have opportunities in, um, uh, in, in, in people establishing nurseries, because also some of the hatcheries are, you know, will offload fry to the uh, farmer, and fry is very small. If you saw from the, from the, from the terminologies there, you saw that the fry were very small fish. So you can imagine if as a farmer you are given fry, how long will it take for it to reach a size, maybe palm size, okay? It means that the farmer will spend more. But if the farmer gets fry or gets a fingerling that is five grams, 10 grams or 20 grams, according to their needs, it means that that farmer is able to reduce the time that the fish spends in their facility. Then we also have the feed manufacturing uh, sector. Of course, we have some big uh, players there. Novatech has come in, which is Zambif. We have um, a company called Ale Aqua. National Milling, uh, I think, has come back into the feed manufacturing. They've bought off um, scraping. Um, yeah, but there's still room for more. Uh, it might not necessarily be feed manufacturing, it could also be uh, retailing, it could also be distribution. So the, 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 the opportunities for investing along the value chain or along the supply chain uh, are, are still there. The other uh, opportunity that exists is in the, um, equipment for excavation of ponds. A lot of farmers are doing pond excavation using the traditional methods of do, using hoes and shovels and, and, and things like that. So how big a pond can you dig with a hole? But if we have people that can, um, that can you know, come in and um, provide, uh, mini excavators or, or just even the, the, the standard excavators. Uh, yeah, I think those are opportunities that uh, business people should be able to, to look at and see whether it makes economic sense to have, a, to have such equipment. Then we have a cage and a pen fabrication. Uh, there, there is some small scale kind of fabrication going around. Um, unfortunately, I forgot to load the picture. I wish I had, but maybe I will send it to, uh, I'll send it to Lumsond and then you can share. There is, um, most of the cages that you are seeing, they're either coming from Europe or they're coming from China. Even the nets are coming from there, okay? So, there are all these opportunities. If aquaculture is going to grow, we need to have it. It needs to be as, as uh, cheap as possible. 
So it starts from sourcing of the materials for cages and for pens, the frames for the cages, uh, because if they're going to come all the way from China and the Chinese person has to come and uh, uh, assemble them. So what happens when you have, uh, when they need to be repaired, when they need to be rehabilitated? You can't always go to China. We must have that technology transfer. Okay. Um, yeah. So in the processing, um, in the processing uh, node of the value chain, uh, yeah, we have opportunities there. The most of the fish that we sell, uh, if you look at the picture that I showed you about fish from Namibia, is not is not packaged in those uh, uh, cartons. It's usually just in crates, okay? So we, 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 even if we have to do exports uh, of fish, maybe in the region, yeah, maybe we have a special arrangement for that, but that should be commonplace. We should have, uh, you know, uh, players that, you know, you can go and, uh, and get somebody who does packaging that you can use food grade packaging for, 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 for fish, for export, or even just for local supply. Mr. Rambo. Uh, yes. I want to interrupt you real quick. Uh, so Professor Liswaneso is about to leave the call, but he okay. had a question. Yes. Uh, Prof, can you ask her? Oh, yes. Uh, thank you very much for your, for your presentation. Interesting. It reminds me of my, my undergrad uh, classes, which I've sort of forgotten now. <laughs> Um, my question is re uh, regarding the, uh, the diseases. Are there any diseases that these farmers are experiencing, if any, around? Um, or, and also, how is the, vet, the veterinary uh, care uh, provided? Are you allowing farmers to, to treat their own fish when they're sick? Or are you, uh, the farmers always have to contact the veterinary services? The other question I had was oh, those those pictures that you you showed us are they all species of uh, the tilapia fish or not? Thank you. Um, thank you for those questions. Yes, we do have uh, diseases, uh, but these are very common in the wild. Um, we have the tilapia lake virus, and we have the um, EUS. Um, currently for farmers, um, we, we have not, um, we have not uh, experienced any uh, outbreaks of diseases, although, I mean, that's something that uh, we foresee with uh, intensive uh, aquaculture, the possibilities for having disease outbreaks are there, especially like uh, on uh, Lake, uh, I think Lake Kariba. The more people uh, get into cage culture, the higher the chances. So some farmers, yes, do experience uh, uh, mortalities where they find the fish has um, lesions, has uh, some uh, fungal infection. Uh, in most cases, uh, we do have um, sort of like uh, remedial measures that the farmers will be told to undertake. Uh, in cases where, yeah, there's um, like wholesale uh, dying of fish, uh, the vet will be called and uh, we take samples to see uh, CVRI, Central Veterinary Research uh, Institute. Uh, the, uh, our vet officers, because we're sitting under the main, same ministry, they have been um, brought on board um, and we have had some... Uh, sort of like refresher courses uh, for these uh, vets so that uh, they are able to easily identify, um, you know, what uh, disease it is or what uh, pathogens that, that could be and things like that. Um, and also to sort of like, um, to strengthen the security uh, issues uh, around uh, diseases, we have, um, developed as a country, we have developed what we're calling the aquatic animal health strategy with uh, the, uh, the help of the Department of Veterinary Services. Uh, we have one of our colleagues, uh, Dr. Mwansa Songe, 
uh, who's uh, a fish, uh, she's, a vet, she's a vet, but her specialization is uh, fish diseases. So she's uh, spearheaded the development of that strategy uh, so that uh, as a country, we are at a place where we are able to um, sort of like, you know, take remedial measures uh, or take action whenever we have, uh, you know, indications of uh, disease. All right, that's interesting. It's good to know that you have very little um, diseases, uh, if any. Uh, but it's, and also it's very encouraging to know that you have everything in place in case something comes up because um, um, fish diseases can spread really fast. There are no borders in the, in the, in the waters. So yeah. uh, that can be very devastating if you don't have anything in place. Uh, like, uh, yeah, good to yeah. know. Yeah. That, that, is, that is very true because, um, yeah, and uh, you see with an outbreak of a disease, like for instance, I'll give an example of Lake Kariba. It can basically wipe out yeah. everybody there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that would be the collapse of the aquaculture yeah. sector as we know it, yeah. yeah. So the management, uh, of course, yeah, people have to adhere to best uh, uh, practices, but um, that, that's, those are situations that as a, a government, we really need to be on top of on top of it and make sure that there's that adherence. But okay. yeah, there are those people that fall through the cracks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Someone is calling me now. I have to go somewhere to another meeting. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, okay. Prof. You have a good one. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, before uh, Ms. Trumbo uh, continues our presentation, uh, for those of you who are still on the call, if you can just go to the chat and uh, write your name and your painter in there, uh, we like to know who, uh, what year you, uh, you left St. Paul's and uh, we also use that to help each other network, uh, you know, get in touch with each other and whatnot. So just put in your name and your painter so Tambala, I saw you came in late. You have to tell us when you graduated from St. Paul's. Uh, there could be somebody from your intake there who wants to talk to you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so just to wrap up on the business opportunities. So we, we also have uh, business opportunities in the cold chain, okay? I'll give you an example of Zambia. Zambif is, uh, they have uh, a motto that they call from farm to fork. So they're basically doing everything. They're doing the production, they're doing the processing, they're doing the cold chain. Uh, some of our, I mean, most of our producers are small scale. So they can't manage to have an integrated system on their farms. So they will rely on somebody that can come and buy the fish in bulk either store it somewhere uh, before distribution or whatever the, 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 the case may be. So where such facilities don't exist, government is trying to partners to come up with what we're calling bulk incentives, but these are opportunities for, for the private sector. So, um, fish is important. Right now, uh, Zambia has uh, a malnutrition rate of about uh, 40%, and uh, about 55% of rural households in Zambia eat fish, or uh, yeah, eat fish or have some form of uh, uh, fish protein, whether it's fish or carpenter or uh, chisense, whatever it is. So fish is very important uh, as a nutrient. It's important also in the developmental stages of children. So we are also promoting uh, inclusion of fish in nutrition, um, what we're calling uh, the most critical, uh, the 1000 most critical days. This is a program that is trying to address malnutrition uh, from conception up to when a child is two years old. 
Thank you. Oh, wow. Oh, this, is, uh, this is a wonderful presentation, uh, Mr. Rambo. So thank you so very much. Um, I'm sure we're going to have some questions here. And uh, I'm going to uh, start off with some questions myself. But before I do that, I just uh, want to thank you for making this presentation and also to invite Mr. Kanchea to, um, to say something if he has uh, in addition. Um, but in summary, um, you have uh, told us that um, this is a very viable uh, business. Uh, it's a very viable activity. Uh, and it's also very helpful at multiple uh, stages or multiple places uh, because there's a critical mass of factors uh, that come together to make this uh, an interesting and viable uh, activity, such as uh, government policy that's uh, uh, you know, forward looking and then the demand uh, due to um, due to increased population, mm -hmm. and uh, also due to uh, change in lifestyle, people wanting white meat. I know people mm -hmm. love fish uh, quite a bit, and I'm one of those. And then also uh, improved uh, distribution mechanisms, which would need uh, you know extra boost in terms of uh, uh, private sector. And then uh, following up on uh, Professor Lisonis's question, uh, I think you've highlighted to the fact that uh, we we do have experts, you know, in the in the in the country that can actually handle uh, rapid, uh, you know, responses if there was an issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and the the one you mentioned, Masan Songe, is actually a good friend of mine. So when uh, you see her, please tell her I said hello. I will. Yeah, yeah, my team, my team event, as we used to okay. say to our kids. <laughs> yeah. Um, I yeah, and then you mentioned uh, uh, vertical integration, which uh, I think uh, does help. I, you, you didn't mention anything about uh, out, outgrowers scheme and everything, but uh, maybe that can come later. So um, with that said, uh, Chalo has a question. Chalo Musosha uh, has a question. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Prof. And uh, thank you for this uh, presentation. Uh, it's been very, very insightful. My concern is, or my question is in regards to uh, the integrity of naturally occurring fish in our rivers. We, uh, today, uh, there's a big emphasis on organic uh, products. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, from some of the descriptions that you've, you've, you've highlighted today, it seems like there's a, a level of genetic modification that's taking place in some of the fish that is grown, whether to increase productivity or resistance to diseases, whatever the case might be. What measures are, does the ministry have in place to protect the integrity of uh, naturally occurring fish in our rivers? Well, so my people in Wapula that like to use uh, uh, mosquito nets for fishing <laughs> can still you know, subsist from, uh, uh, from from the fish industry in those in those areas without necessarily venturing into uh, a commercial version of uh, aquaculture. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, with the the genetic uh, improvement program, uh, we are not necessarily. Uh, manipulating the genetics, or we're not creating a GMO. Uh, Zambia, I think, has a policy on uh, um, introduction of uh, genetically modified um, organisms. What we're doing with, um, with the GIP, or the Genetic Improvement Program, is basically to um, to select fish that exhibit certain traits. I think for this question, I'll ask Mr. Kanchea to maybe uh, share their, what exactly they are doing uh, uh, concerning that. Um, then, but before he comes in, let me finish the other part of the question. Um, in terms of uh, maintaining the integrity of, uh, of uh, of our natural of our natural fish, uh, the principal act, which is the Fisheries Act, does provide for um, 
uh, for you know does have provisions that prohibit the introduction of species or what we call invasive species and also it has provisions for um, um, translocation of a species so an invasive species or an alien species is a species that does not exist for instance in Bangalore or in Luapula in the Luapula system uh, then also we have a situation where, uh, let's say Pale, you know the Pale, Makrocha. Makrocha does exist in Wapola, okay, within the Zambia uh, water system. But getting it out of Luapola and taking it into another river system where it does not exist, that is called translocation. So we have the law pro uh, uh, prohibits such actions. I'm not saying they don't happen, they are happening. So that is the way in which we're trying to, um, uh, to, to promote or maintain the integrity. But believe you me, right now there's a hot debate and it's coming from Luapola. We have some uh, aquaculture farmers that have uh, in, just recently, some of them, I don't know whether you saw it in social media, they went to see the president uh, when he was officiating at the Oksefia Pangwena, and they went to complain and say, we, the Department of Fisheries is uh, keeping them in poverty by stopping them from um, growing, uh, from using niloticus uh, in aquaculture. Okay, so this is a, like a double-edged sword. There are people who want to destroy the integrity of the environment for profit because they're saying we are business people. We can't grow a fish that uh, you are saying it's a, it's it's a, a native, and they have concerns about it not growing. So they want to bring in a foreign fish that they feel uh, will, uh, grows better. But to allay your fears, we are not manipulating the genetics. I think at this point, I'll allow Mr. Gantier to respond. Thank, thank you for that. And uh, just ignore the Wapulans. My people have problems sometimes. Uh, the professor will tell you. <laughs> but they can get me fired. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> oh, uh, Hello. Yes, sir, we can hear you. All right. OK. So with the genetic improvement program, uh, what we are basically doing is uh, getting fish from uh, different areas of the country. Say, if it's uh, the three spotted brim or Andasonai, uh, we get them, say, from uh, Super Upper Zambezi, uh, Kafue River, uh, Luangwa River, and then screen them to check if they have any uh, problems or diseases. If not, uh, then we bring them on the farm and then select uh, for faster growth. Um, so we uh, produce families and from each family, we select fish that are faster growing and then cross them or breed them with another family from another source, uh, which are of the same species. And then, uh, yeah, just selecting those that are faster growing from each batch. Uh, of the family, and then we are improving the growth uh, um, compared to their uh, original grandparents because, yeah, it's like um, selective breeding, so there's no genetic manipulation. So we're just selecting for traits of faster growth in certain species, and then those are the fish that will be given to the farmers so that they have fish that is faster growing. Yeah, I think thank you very much for that clarification. Um, any more questions? Because I, um, I have several. Can I say something before you uh, ask for sure. more questions? Sure. Yes, you, those, uh, you made a, a comment on our outgoer schemes. Yes. Uh, yeah, we have developed models. We have um, the Zambia Aquaculture Enterprise Development uh, Project, which has been running for the last uh, five years and uh, has supported, I think by the end of this year, I think we would have supported over 2000 farmers. Okay. Uh, so part of the, the, the things that we have done is we have identified about five areas which we're calling 
uh, high potential zones. And so in these high potential zones, we are supposed to set up uh, what we call enabling environment in order for farmers to uh, you know, improve, increase production. And some of the things that we have been looking at is uh, development of outgrower schemes. Sorry, so we have um, models for development of uh, outgrower schemes. And then there are some farmers that are already trying to develop outgrower schemes. There's one company right now that is trying to go into some form of outgrower scheme, some form of contract farming, uh, where they will provide certain um, incentives, certain services, technical services, uh, so that farmers produce on their behalf and then they can sell that fish as, and brand it as their own. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, Onward, you have a hand up, uh, but before you go uh, and ask the question, I wanted to say that uh, Mweni had um, written a chat meant for Mr. Kanchea, but he sent it to me directly. So I think Mweni, what you wanted to say was, uh, you wanted to thank Mr. Kanchea for his response, but you sent me a direct message instead, instead of going to the you know general chat. So Mr. Kanchea, just somebody saying thank you for your response there. Uh, Mr. Lombama, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for this meeting. Uh, I'm, 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 I don't come from that kind of life where uh, fish is, is, is really available. Samba is an area where there are no, no rivers. But um, I wanted to, I, I went for an expo and then there are these, I don't know whether they call them cages, where you make them using plants and then you make um, I had written in the chat to ask Mr. Panchea about uh, trying to make, because the test is really different because we feed them. But those that feed naturally, the test is different. So I wanted to ask, say, any way of improving, either feeding them with worms or other things that you can discover and tell us to say, okay, when you feed these, I think the test will still be maintained. And that's what I wanted to, 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 to ask Mr. Kanchea, his research. Hello. Yes, sir, please go ahead. Okay, okay, thank you so much for that question. Sorry, I, I saw the question, but I couldn't respond. The moment I started typing, the network just went off, uh, but at least I'm back online. Um, I think the test of fish, uh, that's a very hard question because the test is very relative. Uh, just like with uh, broiler chicken and village chicken, of course, there's a slightly different. Uh, difference in terms of tests, and usually the test is uh, related maybe to the feeds that are given to the animals. Mm -hmm. But um, maybe if you fed your fish much more naturally, where you they feed more on uh, plankton, uh, they would test much more natural. But as long as they feed on the artificial feeds, of course, the test would be slightly different from the uh, fish from the natural rivers. That's what I would say. Thank you so much. Uh, any more questions? <clears throat> My any question more? is... Yeah, Gandhi, go ahead. Is, from the presentation so far, I think that has been awesome, very educative. Uh, what I will need to know is, for those of us who are interested in to venture into aquaculture, uh, what support uh, does the ministry offer to uh, small-scale farmers in terms of technical uh, information and support in the construction of the ponds or the um, uh, lining of the, the ponds, 
uh, is there anything that the ministry offers that people can from time to time go to them and uh, receive that support and you um uh, how soon is that uh, done thank you thank you for the question hello uh, yes please go ahead um, yeah, so the department uh, offers uh, technical support. Um, so we can basically support you from uh, inception. In fact, we prefer it that way, that uh, you get um, as much information as possible uh, before you go into fish farming, so that uh, you can decide for yourself whether that is uh, for you or it's not. Uh, but uh, in any case, we have farmers that come to us after they've already tested the waters. And sometimes uh, it might be at a point where they have uh, spent a lot of money. Okay, so yes, in short, the government offers you technical support. And currently, we have the aquaculture uh, project, which is um, running, and uh, which in which we have partnered with uh, the Citizen uh, Economic uh, Empowerment Commission (CEEC), um, where CEEC is our fund manager, and uh, so every time there's a call for application. Um, we invite the, the general public or we invite the fish farmers, uh, as it were, to um, apply for those loans and, uh, yeah, and meet when, whenever they, if they meet those conditions, they, uh, they are funded. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the areas in which, so government is providing financing through the, uh, what we're calling the aquaculture seed fund that is hosted by CEC and uh, government offers technical support um, so that uh, you can execute your, 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 your um, aquaculture project successfully. Um, if you are in an area where, for instance, you have problems with water retention, we have uh, a, a number of private players that um, stocking dam liners. So these are things that you have to buy. Um, and also other accessories that you, you might require. Sometimes you can buy those things uh, through the same loan that you get through CEC. Or you, if you're able to finance uh, aquaculture independently, uh, those are options that are always uh, available to the farmer. I hope I've answered the question adequately. Yeah, thank you for the information. Yes, our offices are open. We are in all the 117 districts. Uh, if you are in Lusaka, we are there in Chilanga, which is our head office. We are also there at the fish farm. We are there in Lusaka at Quarter House for those that are in Lusaka. We are there in Chongwe, if you have a farm in Chongwe, in Tafiwe. Where we were basically there. So you can always uh, call me, call us. If you are on the Copper Belt, you can come to any of our districts. Um, we, uh, we have the provincial office in Indola. We have the district office at the same place. We have the National Aquaculture Research and Development Center where Mr. Kanchea is based. Uh, and we have staff there to help you with uh, whatever you might require. So and by the way, we also have, uh, we also periodically also offer uh, uh, residential trainings for farmers. We do that at uh, uh, Nadik in Kitwe, where Mr. Kanche is coming from. But we are also starting to, to do short courses in Kafiwe at our fisheries training uh, institute in Kasaka. Well, that's wonderful. So on that note, um, 
uh, Mr. Rambo, do you mind uh, afterwards maybe sharing the, the contact information so that when we send out the video, uh, we, can share, we can share that as well um, okay. for both you and Mr. Kanchia. So I know people are going to want to contact you um, afterwards. Um, but also we've, we've taken an hour and a half, uh, uh, you know, of your time. Uh, so I don't know if there's any more questions. Um, or we could actually wrap it up. Uh, gentlemen, do you have any questions for Ms. Uh, Chiram? Um, and I think we just missed uh, uh, the PS for Agric. Uh, Mr. Mbozi was in the call, but he had to, to leave early. Uh, normally he, he joins us and uh, he would, you know, uh, support uh, what you guys are doing. Uh, I know you're a different ministry now, but uh, I'm sure he was going to say something about what the league, what the government policies are. Thank God you told me after he, after I've done the presentation. <laughs> I know Mr. Mbozi. Oh, you know Mr. Green Mbozi. He's one of us yes. from our, our school. No, okay, because we when we were in the same ministry, he used to be director for agribusiness. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, he's very passionate about agribusiness, and uh, uh, we've had a few uh, discussions about that. He, he supports it quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. And uh, speaking about Zema, you, you spoke about Zema earlier. Yes. Uh, the new uh, vice uh, board chairperson, I think that's, the, that's what it's called, is uh, one of us as well. Okay, so there's a lot cool. of uh, crossbreeding yeah. of that's, these fingerlings. Okay, no, that's that's very helpful. So if I have uh, farmers that have issues, I know where to go. I will call you and you link me with with the various uh, influential people that I need to sort <laughs> out my farmers issues. Influential. <laughs> yeah, yes. absolutely. Yeah, this is uh, this is wonderful, though. Um, but yeah, um, I don't know if you have any last comments and we could wrap up the uh, the meeting. Okay. Do you have any uh, last comments? Um, well, I I think it's um, it's it's what can I say? Um, well, basically, the, 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 there is a lot that is happening in the sector, and uh, we barely scratched the the surface, mm -hmm. and um, and yes, it's a it's a new sector. That's uh, one thing. This we still have some challenges. I didn't want. To, I mentioned those, but I probably was marrying them with the the opportunities. So whatever opportunities I was talking about, those are basically challenges. Um, so we do have challenges. It's a, it's a new um, it's a new value chain. Uh, we have challenges with um, with uh, uh, certain inputs. Uh, sometimes you find farmers don't get their feed on time, and that's, that affects the, the, their performance. And, um, and also in terms of financing, there are some people that, uh, you know, they still have those uh, tendencies where they think government uh, money is uh, free. So there are all these things that are, are, are there that are happening. But uh, yeah, we, we, we have hope that uh, this is a sector that will contribute tremendously to the growth of, uh, of uh, agriculture mm -hmm. and also contribute uh, significantly to the, um, you know, to mm -hmm. the GDP, yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you so much for this uh, presentation. It's been very uh, informative. Uh, hopefully in the next uh, iteration of it, we shall have, uh, you back with uh, Dr. Muka to talk, to expand on those uh, illnesses, but mm -hmm. also, also um, or diseases. And then also maybe talk about the um, other uses of fish, because uh, so far we just spoke about consumption uh, yes. or you know, eating, but I'm sure there's yes. other things you mentioned, because when you spoke about Egypt, you mentioned uh, what they're using fish products for in pharmaceuticals and other stuff, yeah. uh, you know, confectionaries. So we, we yeah. can talk about that uh, when we have another one hour uh, next yeah. time. But uh, 
this has been really, really wonderful. And uh, thanks for your generosity of time and uh, expertise. And uh, we know our country is in good hands with people like you, for sure. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, yeah, gentlemen, it's uh, Friday in Jakarta for the rest of you, uh, some of us this morning. So let's uh, talk on the on the WhatsApp. I'm going to share the uh, details uh, for both uh, Mr. Kanshe and Ms. Chirambo so you can contact them directly. With that said, adios, uh, Labor Omnia Bin City. Thank you, thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor, for this meeting. I'm, I'm sure I'm, 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 I'm leaving the meeting thank just you. now. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you for the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Yep, cheers. Yeah, where is no bit? No bit.